sermon that my dad wrote before he died. I have been waiting for about two and a half years, well, about two years, uh, to present this. COVID sort of got in the way. I was planning to present this last year, but then come November last year, if you wonder what happened on this date last year, I do, because uh, uh, that was the date that the lockdown started. And so I wasn't going to present this sermon to the three people or four people who were here that Sunday. And then we didn't get back to meeting in smaller groups till January, and I wasn't going to present it then. And so I decided that I'll hold it back. I was taking a little bit of a gamble uh, with COVID, but I will hold it back until November because uh, Wednesday will be the third anniversary of the, of the day that he died. And so this was his final sermon uh, and uh, that he wrote when he was in the hospital uh, uh, with his cancer. The title actually comes from a lesson he's preached before, and I, I had to look this up because I've heard him say this, but I didn't know exactly what he was referring to because when it was actually said, uh, I was only one years old. And so this comes from a former American president, Ronald Reagan, and what he said in, his, in the 1984 presidential debate in the United States. He was asked why, as a religious person, he didn't attend church on a regular basis. That was when you could still ask religious questions in political debates. Uh, think about that. Uh, a politician getting asked a religious question in the debate today, that, that would quite cause quite the uproar and the stir. His answer, which received great applause line after that, was that because of concerns, uh, security concerns, about putting the congregation where he would visit in danger, and there, there was terrorist activity going on at the time, especially in Lebanon, he didn't feel that it was right for, the, for him to put the um, congregation in danger, and that he feels that the Lord understands his position. That, that's what he said. In truth, that answer, the Lord understands, is merely Mr. Reagan stating his opinion, his hopes. For the Lord didn't say that he would understand. Now, I recognize that the dangers that he as president of the United States might actually put on the congregation might be very real. Let's not come along and say, well, he had no foundation for even considering something like that. But if that truly was the case, ceasing to worship God was not the solution. Because as, as most of you know, the White House is a very large complex doesn't require grand buildings and large numbers for a church to exist. A church can exist in much smaller numbers. And I'm sure he would not have had problems finding people who would come to the White House complex to worship God if that's really what he wanted to do. Other things could have been considered. I'm not passing judgment on what he, on what could or could not. I'm just using the statement, God will understand as the focus of today's lesson, because this idea that God will understand our actions, even if they don't line with scriptures, is not new, and we need to beware of it. People have used this phrase, God will understand, to try to justify many things. First, they try to justify why they haven't been baptized, because they believe that belief comes after salvation. That you, or sorry, that salvation comes after belief. I have that backwards. That they were saved when they believed, 
And then, well, yes, Christ said we should be baptized, but God will understand if I don't do that right away. God will understand. It's not really that important to God because scriptures teach we're saved by faith, which the scriptures do, but they don't teach you're saved by faith alone. What would happen if someone died? This is what their question often asks. What would happen if someone died after coming to faith in Christ, but before being baptized? Would God really condemn them to hell? Certainly God would understand and wouldn't condemn them to hell, right? But whether or not God will understand is for God to decide about a person in that situation. But the point is, the person making the statement is not in that situation. Using what we come up with, hypotheses we come up with, with excuses, really, that we come up with as to why we don't do something, because what happens if, what about that, that person over there? What about doesn't matter? What are we doing? We leave God to deal with those people. But what really is being done here is a smokescreen in order to justify why we didn't obey. The scriptures are very clear on the matter. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. What was the gospel that was to be taken into all the world and preached by the disciples? It was the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That was the gospel that was to be taught. That is the foundation for everything else that we place our faith in. We place our faith in what who Jesus was and is what he did in dying on the cross, why it was necessary, and the proof of that is in the resurrection of Christ, that just as he was raised from the dead by the Father, we also can not only be raised to walk in his life through baptism, but we have the hope of the resurrection come the judgment day. What was the response to the gospel to be? Belief and baptism. How much clearer could Jesus have been? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Ah, but it didn't say he who is not baptized. That's because baptism alone doesn't save. We can argue about that all we want. We talked this morning in Bible class how worship and sacrifice alone doesn't save us. Baptism alone doesn't save. Just dunking someone in water doesn't do them any good if they have no faith in Christ. That's why Jesus didn't have to say, he who does not believe and is not baptized, because there's no power in the water. The power is in our faith in the work of God in remitting our sins. If you remember the story of Naaman, back in the book of I think it's, I think it's Second Kings. I didn't write it down. Naaman was told. Naaman had leprosy. He was told to go dip seven times in the River Jordan, and the leprosy would be gone. Now Naaman went away angry, and his servant said, "Why are you going angry? If the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it?" When was Naaman's leprosy healed? Not when he believed the word of the prophet through the word the word of the God the word of God through the prophet. It's when he believed and did. He did dipped one time. No, no leprosy gone. Two times, three times, four times, no leprosy gone. Five times, six times, no leprosy gone. Seven times. The way God had said. And when he came up the seventh time, his leprosy was healed. His faith acted, and he was healed. God says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. God will understand, cannot be an excuse as to why we don't obey that. 
People also use this phrase, God will understand, for not being part of Christ's church. They say, is God really going to cast people into hell who have faith in Christ but don't attend church regularly? Or they don't attend a church? Maybe they attend a denominational church that doesn't follow Christ. Certainly God will understand that it's more convenient for me to go to a church that's closer to my house than it is for me to have travel time. This congregation is unique in how far people come to worship God. There are some people who travel from an hour to the north. Some people who travel from more than an hour and a half to the east. Some people travel 40 minutes from the west. There are very few people, I think it's just Henry and me, who live within 10 minutes of this building. I asked a preacher from another congregation, how far do the members of the congregation, he's a member of a uh, medium-sized congregation in the States, how far do they travel? It's so on average 15 minutes. That's usual, but not in the city of Toronto. Not only are there not many churches in Ontario that faithfully follow God, but the vast size of the city of Toronto and the greater Toronto area is immense. It can take, in good traffic, it can take you 40 minutes to travel from the farthest east point in Scarborough to the farthest west point in near Mississauga at the airport if you're doing the speed limit and you don't have stop and go traffic. That's, in, that, that's a quite a large city to have to go through. And people travel long periods of time, that's the point. But there are some who say, well, it's just, it's more convenient if I go to this denomination or that denomination. Who really cares? Does God, God will understand after all. Ephesians chapter 4, in verses 4 to 6, Paul wrote there, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now I ask the question, will God save people who believe in a different Lord? Will he save people who live, believe in a different Holy Spirit? Or who practice a different faith? Will he save people like that? Not in that condition, no. So why do we believe that he will save people who are part of a different body of Christ? Well, not of Christ, but claim to be of the body of Christ, but are part of a different body. Why do we think that God would understand if he won't when it comes to all those other things? Now people say, but all churches have their problems. Look at the church in Corinth. Paul called them saints there. Yes, he did. He called them saints in the beginning of the book, despite their problems, but he didn't let them live in their problems. He called on them in numerous places to repent or you will not inherit the kingdom of God. The problem that we see in the New Testament wasn't a problem of denominationalism, although the factions that existed could have led to that and did uh, eventually lead to that. The problems we see in Corinth are problems of accepting unrepented sin and false doctrine that was seeping into the church. The churches there were still teaching the basic gospel, the plan of salvation. They were making Christians, but they had things they needed to repent of afterwards. Not everybody in, in the churches were involved in all the sins that were mentioned, either in Corinth or in many of the other churches that had problems. <coughs> those people who were not involved in those types of sins could be saved irregardless of what everyone else did. Because the church was still, for the most part, teaching the truth. And the Christians there were not accepting the false doctrines. They probably were fighting against them, trying to lead others back to Christ. Sin, though, can never be accepted 
by, in a Christian's life or can ever be accepted by the church. If the church is doing something that requires everybody to sin, I cannot be a part of that church. And the fact of the matter is, when it comes to denominationalism and the false doctrine that are out there today, why can I not be a member of the Baptist church? <coughs> because the Baptist church teaches another faith other than Christ. You can't go to that church and say, well, they're making Christians. They, they might be doing something. I'm going to try to teach them what they need to do. It, But after they repent of that, then they're fine. They're not saved to begin with because they don't teach the gospel plan of salvation. I can't be a part of that. Now, can I go and call them to repent and turn back to God? Absolutely. Just like every other person who's in sin. But they're teaching a different faith, a different gospel, and a different plan of salvation. They are not part of Christ's body to begin with. Therefore, they first need to come to Christ and then give up all those other doctrines. That's what needs to happen. I need to be part of a church that teaches the gospel, first of all, practices the truth, and if there are things that need correcting, I can go about trying to help people, just like I would expect them to try to help me if I was in sin. But I got to first, I got to first, belong to the body of Christ. I'm not part of the body of Christ if I'm teaching another gospel. I'm part of some other body. God will not understand if I attend a church that is not following Christ. God will also not understand if I decide, well, I don't need to be a part of any church. Really, who cares if I worship every Sunday? Is it really that important? Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25 says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Worship should be something we want to do, and something we should be seeking to do. What about my job? Am I not to work? Oh well, yeah, we're to work. But God said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Do we have faith in that statement? If we seek first the kingdom of God and leave God the rest, I think we'd be amazed at what God can do if we let him. We come along with our own ideas, well, I have to have this job. Do you really? Do you think you can't find another job that might not take you away from worship every Sunday? Are there really no jobs out there? I know of many. No one here works on Sunday morning. That's, you're here. You're not working today. Because you want to be here. We should desire to be here. Worship is important. Not only to praise God, but to stir up love and good works in one another. Think of what being a part could lead us to do. Can lead us to becoming a passive Christian. Can lead us to sin. We should want to be here to worship God, and we should want to be here to stir up one another. To stir up one another, to be stirred up in love and good works. That's why we come to worship every Sunday. God will not understand if I don't obey his will. The Bible does not teach that God will understand our lack of humble obedience. In Genesis 3, 1 to 20, Eve was lied to by Satan. She was deceived by Satan, but was not excused for her sin, despite believing a lie and following it. We discussed earlier in Cain's worship in Genesis chapter 4. Cain did something but not what God wanted. God did not understand Cain's <coughs> obedience. He called him to repent of the sin that he committed. Uzzah, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, in verses 1 to 8, if you don't know that story, the Ark of the Covenant was being moved by David from, uh, from where it was into the city of David, into Jerusalem. Remember, the Philistines had captured it, and then Philistines had 
their gods were being were being chopped up and and destroyed by having the ark in their temples and so they sent it back to Israel and it had been in the house in, in, a, in a house of a, a person for a great period of time and then even before Saul and then David decided well we're going to bring it to Jerusalem that's where it should be that's where worship should be and he put it on an ox cart to transport it to Jerusalem. You say, well, what's the problem with that? Well, Numbers made it quite clear that the ark, that the ark was to be transported on the shoulders of the sons of Kohath, which were the, the tribe of Levi. And they were told, even the sons of Kohath were not allowed to touch it, lest you die. That was the command. Now, People were going along, the ark was going along great until they got to the threshing floor and the oxen stumbled. Now, see the oxen stumble, the ark was going to hit the ground. That would have been bad. It would have damaged the ark. So what does it do? He put his hand to steady it. That's all he did. And God struck him dead. Why? Well, they disobeyed God. It started with the ox cart. If it had gone to Jerusalem without the oxen stumbling, would, would God have been pleased? We don't know. It didn't. Perhaps God would have come along and punished them anyway. But Uzzah paid the price for not following God's command and touching the ark. They put himself between a rock and a hard place. They would have sinned no matter what happened. But he sinned in this way and God punished him. God didn't understand lack of obedience there. King Saul, in 1 Samuel 13, verses 1 to 15, offered a sacrifice when Samuel wasn't available. He didn't have the authority to do that. God didn't understand. In 1 Samuel 15, 1 to 35, God, Saul was told to go kill all the Amalekites, utterly destroy them for what the, the children of Amalek did to the children of Israel on their journey from Egypt to Sinai. Uh, that story is found in Exodus. And so Saul was told there, you go do that. And he did, except he spared King Agag and the flock. The people spared the flock. Saul almost obeyed, but didn't. And God punished him. God said, I'm going to rend the king from you and give it to a man after my own heart. Almost but lost. And then he got the rich young ruler in Matthew 19 in verses 16 to 22. He kept the law. He said, came to Jesus and said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you kept the law. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. He said, I kept all of those from my youth. <coughs> Jesus said, well, you have one thing. Go sell all you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. The rich young ruler had done, supposedly, what the law had said. But he had one thing left. He trusted in money more than he trusted in God. Jesus doesn't tell us to sell all that we have and give to the poor. He does tell us to give to the poor. But he doesn't tell us to do that. However, if money is getting in the way of us serving God, that's what we should do. If our job's getting in the way of serving God, we need to find another job. If our family's getting in the way, we need to correct our family. We can't always leave our family, but we need to find a way to take away that problem. Whatever it is, we need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto, uh, uh, unto us. Now, if God didn't understand any of those situations, why would we expect him to understand if we alter worship. Colossians 3.16 says, let, everyone, let the word of God, Christ will in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. A lot of people come along today and say, what's wrong with instrumental music? That verse says to sing. But no verse says, thou shalt not have instrumental music. You're correct. There is no verse that says that. But this verse says sing. We know that's right with God, because God wrote it. 
there is no authority for instruments of music in worship at the church. Who am I to tell God, you will understand if I do these things because I'm doing it for you? God expects us to obey him in all things. We shouldn't expect God to understand if we decide, well, we're going to change the Lord's Supper. Unleavened bread, fruit of the vine, well, those are a little hard to make. Or those don't taste that good. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 26 to 29, well, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink, you all of it, all, drink, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We have no authority to substitute water for grape juice. We have no authority to, to uh, change bread to cake, unleavened bread to, to whatever bread we like, sourdough bread's Naomi's favorite. Uh, maybe you have a different type of bread you like. All of it's leaven. We don't have a right to change that. Christ, as we discussed last week, Christ used unleavened bread. He used grape juice, fruit of the vine. That's what the Lord said. That's what God will understand if we use. He will not understand if we change. Nor will he understand if we change God's plan of salvation. We read earlier Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved but he who does not believe will be condemned. Peter said in Acts 2.38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the plan of salvation. That's how we become a Christian. We believe in Christ. We repent of our sins. We're baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. That's how we become a Christian. We don't become a Christian by believing in Christ and praying that he come into our heart and save us. We don't have the right to substitute prayer for baptism. God will not understand that, just as he didn't understand any of those other substitutions that mankind made in times past. So my dad's final exhortation to us all is this. God will only understand if we seek to do things his way. When we seek to do things our own way, then we shouldn't expect God's approval. Rather, we should expect his disapproval. And if left unrepented, ultimately, his punch. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to declare.